Hello and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people who are out there actively making and doing creative work. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, and what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. And along the way, I'm also learning more about the nature of creativity itself. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'll be talking with potter Keith Brimmer Jones. Some of you may know Keith from his appearances as a judge on the BBC's Great Pottery Throwdown here in the UK. What you may not know is that Keith is also an entrepreneur, running two businesses, one selling his own work and the other translating the artwork of other artists onto other media. And in this conversation, we talk about how the discipline that Keith learned as a production potter helps to drive his work today, how he balances running his business with his own creative practice, and even how running that business actually enhances his creative work. We also talk about the importance of identifying your strengths and weaknesses and even knowing when to ask for help. This was a great conversation full of exciting ideas, so please enjoy. Hello, uh, I'm Keith Brimer jones and I, uh, I own a company called Make International and I design mostly, predominantly, uh, ceramics because I'm a potter and we also do fabric and tin and glass and all sorts. And we sell to about 30 or 40 countries around the world. And I'm sitting in my studio in Whitstable in Kent at the moment. You were working in other materials beyond the, the ceramics. So you mentioned tin, for example. How, how does that work? So, so, so basically, um, uh, Dom, my business partner, and I formed a company, oh, some few years ago now, called Make International. And basically, Make International is an umbrella company, really, for taking on different brands. So obviously our core brand is the Keith Bymer Jones word range and, and various other ranges that, that I do. But then underneath that, um, we have a Jane Foster or uh, a brand called Burton Boy or Suki. And basically, uh, we start off with developing ceramics for those particular brands uh, or designers or illustrators. And then if I feel uh, we can scale that up into other product areas like fabric or glass or tin, uh, we do so. Um, and so we have a, a kind of a quite a broad spectrum of factories that we work with in various places, mostly the Far East, but uh, India, uh, some in, in Europe and so forth. And we produce and develop products under those particular brands. So uh, I don't know if this question is relevant to you then. Uh, like, do you do you have a typical day in the studio? And, and if you do, what does that look like? God, I, I wish I did. I wish I did. Uh, basically, um, I used to have a typical day. Uh, and the typical day used to be, I, I, I roughly sort of start around 6, 6.30 in the morning. I get on the wheel and I start throwing or developing shapes for particular, uh, for particular projects that we've got on. And... I really like working very early in the morning uh, because come nine o'clock, I tend to find that I feel like I've achieved something <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because I used to be a production potter uh, and I used to be a production thrower where I'd throw, oh, a good thousand pots a day uh, on the wheel. And i had done that for so, so long now that that's just been instilled and ingrained in me, really, um, of that particular kind of sort of early morning routine, which, which I, I sort of prefer. So, um, yeah, I, I usually start really early. Um, now, because obviously my remit is different and also my remit from obviously being the judge on the TV program, I'm very, I'm away a lot. And I'm, I'm very rarely in the studio at the moment, which is a, a real shame because uh, the best part of my job is actually throwing on the wheel. So, um, so I, I prefer that. But the first thing I ever do when I get in to the workshop is make a cup of coffee. That's, that's definitely the thing to do. Um, the second thing, followed closely by, um, by donning my overalls. I usually, I usually have my overalls on first thing in the morning. And I think, I think again, because I've done it for so long, the minute I put my overalls on, I go into work mode. And it being a studio, and, and obviously it being nice up here, but, but, down, but downstairs it's, uh, it's clay um, and dusty. So uh, it, it enables me putting my overalls on. It's a real practical reason. Putting my overalls on, I can go downstairs and upstairs, and it doesn't matter where I am. And I, just, I, I chop and change between the two. 
computers and clay don't really go well together. <laughs> no, they don't. I can imagine they wouldn't. So, so it sounds like you've got a really varied workload. What is it that you're working on at the moment? Okay, well, at the moment I'm working on, um, I've just started working with a guy called Bert, who runs a sort of a brand, if you like, called Bert and Boy. And um, he's based down in Devon, and he does quite fairly sort of very, very contemporary stylized nautical designs. And we've just designed a range of ceramics for him. And I'm now working on developing uh, placemats and coasters, uh, predominantly for John Lewis. So there, that, that, if you like, in a, in a nutshell, is a typical example of what happens. Obviously, we've developed the mugs. Uh, they're obviously ceramic, uh, something I obviously know a lot about. And now I'm working on all the placemats and coasters to accompany the designs, basically, which I also know quite a lot about now because we've done various uh, products uh, in placemat and coaster form for years. So, so that's basically what I'm working on at the moment. What does that look like in reality in terms of um, managing the conversation with someone who has created something that's clearly a very specific expression of themselves, and now you're, you're taking some of that and you're adapting it and twisting it, and there must be a certain amount of compromise or maybe discomfort in seeing that the materials change from what he's used to working with, and now it's maybe flattened and put into a 2D image, for example? Actually, you know what? That's a very, very relevant question. The reason for that is because, because for so many years, well, a good 30 years, I've, I've been working predominantly, as I say, in clay and designing ranges for people like Habitat and Conran and, you know, Marks and Spencers and various people like that. And I'm, I'm very aware of, uh, obviously, the design process and the development process. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like to have uh, a very, very good close relationship with the particular designer. So the first thing I will always say to a new designer or a new brand that comes on board is I want to try and make whatever products we produce completely unique to your brand. That's the first and foremost thing to do. Partly not because, uh, not because I'm just trying to win them over, but from, from a, 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 a sort of design perspective, and a, and a sort of a, a, a consumer base perspective, we're trying to do, always trying to produce something completely different. And one of the main things that I always say to the designers is that my ultimate goal is whoever I'm designing ceramics for, at the end of the day, I want to be able to uh, produce that mug shape and uh, for a consumer to say, oh, that's a Burton Boy mug, even if it doesn't have that design on it because I want the shapes and the concept of whatever we design to be intricately sort of related to that particular uh, designer or, or, um, or illustrator or whatever. So coming on to uh, sort of placemats and coasters and fabric and all the other things, it's paramount that, that you keep, the, uh, because I have the design background myself, it's paramount and, and I, I, well, I'd like to think that they believe and trust that the design process that I go through uh, is is very closely linked with what they do. I, I constantly have meetings with them and, uh, and constantly reassuring them. Uh, not that that's sometimes necessary because of the relationship with the, I, ha, I have with some of them, but I'm constantly reassuring them that basically the, you, the design, the design and the illustration ethic of what they stand for is paramount to anything that we produce. And obviously, we wouldn't go away and, and, and pile it high and sell it cheap and produce something that that particular brand wasn't happy with or it wasn't conducive to the way they want to be portrayed. That is paramount as far as I'm concerned because, because you know, I, I have uh, quite a bit of empathy with that because of my background and where I come from. So, so that, is, that is paramount, yeah. And so... I'm curious to know what the balance is, I guess maybe over the course of a year, between you being able to do things that are completely your own creative projects, your own expression, versus yeah. things that you are collaborating with other designers on. And, and, and how, do you, how do you maintain that balance? 
in favour of the other brands, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, because I have basically two heads, really. I am a, a director and the design director of Make International, i.e. so I'm responsible for all the other brands that we take on. But I'm also Keith Brimer jones who heads up the, 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 the brand of Keith Brimer jones word range. So, it, it, yeah, it's a very, it very much is a jigsaw, uh, a jigsaw between, or a seesaw, not a jigsaw, a seesaw between the two. It's a, it's a real balancing act. And, and if I'm not careful, what, what tends to happen is that I get lost in, uh, you know, make international and developing lots of things for other, other designers. And, uh, my, my projects are left by the wayside, which is, uh, which, so, which is sometimes really kind of frustrating and kind mm. of unfortunate. But um, but what, what what's happened recently for me is um, because I've because I've been doing this TV show and because I've been in touch with a lot more potters and ceramics people uh, because of the various events that I I attend or talk at or whatever I'm getting really really infused and more involved and intrigued in the different creative ceramic processes that I can do within a mass production setting so. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, in the next couple of weeks, really experimenting downstairs with the various techniques that I want to, want to try and achieve for not only my brand, but, but other, other brands as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I'm, I'm very much sort of infused about the different clay and glaze reactions that one can get. And, and I've been inspired, basically, by, by the potters I've met recently and, and doing the throwdown, doing the show. It's been great. I'm so curious how you maintain this balance. Have you have you had to sort of block out time in your schedule in order to have the space to explore these new ideas? How does that work? Is that an organic thing where you just, oh, I actually happen to have some time here in the calendar. I'm going to make the use of it now. Or have you had to really work hard to, to maintain that space for yourself? Well, it, it's a bit of both, uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, uh, you know, allocating time, this, that, and the other. But But you probably know as well as anyone if you do anything creatively, um, uh, for me, um, the way I was trained uh, was really old school. And, and for me, it's all about discipline. And it's disciplining yourself to, to, to allocate certain amounts of time to certain projects or to certain things. Now, where I, whereas I used to have to have discipline in producing thousands of pieces uh, in one week, um, that, that sort of uh, discipline structure has changed slightly where I now have to uh, allot myself uh, different pieces of time uh, for various projects and, and, and it's within those different pieces of time that's when you have to be really disciplined and focused on one particular uh, 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 project and, and for me uh, that, I find that really hard to do because also as you probably are aware that when you're creative you, you, you're buzzing around do, trying to do loads of different things and things fly into your head, ideas fly into your head all the time and you're, you're sort of all, all, almost constantly chasing yourself uh, until you, you finally get, uh, get projects finished and, and, and signed off. But, but, but really the main thing, uh, I would say, anything creatively, it's, it's discipline because that's the way I was taught. Uh, discipline, discipline, discipline is the, is the real thing. You, you, I know you hear of, of artists and, and, and creative type saying, oh, you know, um, you know, I'm just really free and I'm, you know, I just let things just, just happen and this, that and the other. Uh, that's all well and good. But, but when you're working in a commercial setting as well, you have to do the balancing act between the commercial side of things and the creative side. Um, mm. And I think that's why... Uh, it works so well here because I've, I've always got that commercial s side uh, in the back of my head. I'm always thinking of timelines, deadlines of when we've got to launch product in for, for, for the next season or whatever. And, and that's, that's really where I really have to focus on, on, on various timelines, really. With regards to that, running a, a business, 
I, well, first off, aren't there any aspects of running the business that you have come to enjoy or that you actively enjoy? Because I think a lot of creative people think of business as sort of the death of creativity, of having to put a, a price tag or um, limits or strictures on their on, on that freedom that you're talking about. And I'm just curious to know how you've come to that, because it's such a big part of what you do. Are, are there elements that you enjoy or that, that have surprised you, that have opened up new opportunities that you would have anticipated before running a business? Yeah, well, 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 fortunately for me, my business partner does the pennies and I do the pots. And, and that's, that's basically how we met. We met at a trade fair many, many years ago. And he, he, I was a sole trader. I was a, I was a potter in my own right. I was doing my own thing. Uh, basically, he said, you know, I, this is a really good idea. Let's scale it up. Uh, and he basically said to me, look, I have no design sense whatsoever. I'm even colorblind, for God's sake. You do the pots and I'll do the pennies. And actually, that's what that's done is it's split the company in two. So you, you have the business and the commercial side of it, and then you have uh, the creative side. And what, what happens is that when Dom and I get together, we definitely argue the toss over what I, I feel is a really good product and what he feels he can sell. There's definitely that friction there, uh, but, but it's a healthy friction. Uh, and it's a realistic friction. And um, and for me, um, you know, because because we have to sell things to to actually actually survive and make money, it's very important to have that um, that sort of observation on on the creative side of the business. Also, there's nothing like working on a project, a particular project, to uh, to focus the mind. And to take you in a certain direction. And it's interesting because, you know, pottery, uh, you, you know, you start with the idea. Well, ideas are infinite, hopefully, if you're, if you're that, that way inclined. You then start with the clay. The clay, again, could be fairly infinite. There are a myriad of clays that you could use. You then start with the decorative techniques. They are infinite. You can, you can, you can decorate and glaze. Uh, till you're blue in the face, um, and you could then start all over again. Um, so, so having having a having a kind of a focus or a or a particular project actually is a really way good way of achieving the maze and the labyrinth of going through through the end result. Because I know potters that that really just they never stop testing. They never stop sampling. And that's great if you have that opportunity. But, but uh, if you're working um, to earn money, to eat, you, you've got to have a focus on what you do. And what you find is that, that at the end of that project or at the end of that particular uh, answer, if you like, you have a new skill or a new development uh, or a new um, decorative technique that you've never used before. And, and you know, you can then use that uh, for future reference. And I find that really, really inspiring. And, and uh, I find that that, that that for me really helps me. Uh, and the other thing, uh, obviously owning a business, um, I travel a lot. Um, I travel a lot to China, uh, to India, and various other places. And um, it's great meeting the various people and the various techniques and factories and craftsmen's, craftsmanship that you come across and I, I absolutely love that I, th I think it's great I love seeing how things are made I absolutely love it mm. Mm. so it sounds like the, the, the running the business actually gives you a, a, a structure in, almost in your creative life because it, it's giving you almost like many briefs to work to that, yeah. Then, yeah, that might then direct a different avenue of investigation so how much space is there for taking risk because being a, being creative generally is is about trying things out, and and there's often a certain amount of risk. I either yeah, on a very small scale, what happens if I use a different color, or on quite a big scale. But when there's a, a financial imperative, when you know you've got to get a product to market, or you need you need something that's saleable, how do you balance exploring new ideas or taking risks, you know, creative risks, knowing that at some point this has to reach market? Well, that's the wonderful thing about having a studio, obviously, because. Uh, hopefully you can knock out most of the risk by me playing about in the studio. And, and you know, uh, uh, well, actually, that's one of the, I suppose that's one of the frustrations and the frictions I have with my business partner is that he seems to think sometimes that you come up with an idea, 
you follow it through and it's that's the end of it well you know as well as i do uh, a writer will will maybe write a book and then rewrite it and then rewrite it uh, and and it's a process and it's a process of trial and error uh, and fortunately for me because of, in my studio i'm i'm able to play about uh, to to uh, to test things before i then take it to mass production now as you as you quite rightly indicate that's still still not a risk free uh, exercise uh, but but hopefully what you're trying to do is you're honing down and focusing more and more on that particular design or project or uh, product or finish uh, that that feels very comfortable to you and obviously to the the person you you're working with um, and hopefully fingers crossed uh, we sell shed loads but 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 yeah. it's um, but 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 obviously you know the other thing that, that that we have is that we have a great relationship with the various factories that we uh, that we produce with and sometimes we can get small runs done uh, just to test the product out but when I'm talking about small runs I'm talking of you know a, a minimum order of a, a thousand or fifteen hundred of, of one particular design which in our scale now is actually not that bad that's that's fine that's like maybe a studio potter testing out you know three or four pots uh, to see if they work in a certain gallery setting or in a certain new sort of uh, direction that they want to go in so yeah but, but you're right there's always a, an element of risk and 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 creativity in in itself by definition is a risk is a risky business um, but you know that's one of the things that draws us to it really we like to take that element of risk and we like to experiment so so yeah i mean it, it, it's all to play for really brilliant so in a different direction then are, are there any things that you do that are not creative that are out of the studio out of the business that you find feed you either feed your creativity or give you ideas but that you're not doing with the intention of discovering a solution and you're just doing them because you enjoy them and they somehow give something back to you yeah yeah um swimming walking and looking at buildings uh, i love buildings um and maybe that 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 because it t- ties into my uh dyslexic uh tendencies um i suffer from dyslexia not not too much now i mean you know you, you get to you get to learn how to how to uh, to use that dyslexia, and uh, I don't know whether you're aware, but but dyslexic people have a, a much uh, a better sense of form, um, volume, space um, than than most uh, other people that don't. Um, I did not know large, that. No, well, there's a large percentage a large percentage of architects are dyslexic. Norman Foster is is dyslexic, um, and and it's they have this great affinity with with shape, form, and volume, and space, and um, and I live down by the sea, and, uh, and 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 walking and swimming for me is a great release, um, just to let your 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 head just uh, try and empty your head and fill it up with other things other than what you're working on at that particular time, uh, and and it's it's a tough one, it's a catch twenty two because it's like if you're under pressure to to, to do something, it's you're constantly thinking of that thing, but sometimes, without sounding too hippie nightmare about it, sometimes to actually free your mind of all that stuff, to actually give you uh, an answer to a particular problem, and uh, and you know it's like you sometimes just have to relax and let go of it in order to move on. It's a, it's a weird one, yeah, yeah. Mm. No, I, I completely understand that. I think it's almost creating space for the subconscious to to rear its head and say, hey, actually, I got this other idea. Or, what happens if we put this together with that? Uh, abs- absolutely. And, and you, need, you need that time and space to enable that, that process to happen in your head mm. or in your brain or in your life. And, and obviously, working in a commercial setting, um, that's sometimes quite a hard thing to balance because you're always working up against deadlines. So... Um, um, my 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 part my partner Marge is uh, is actually in Panta. She's an actor as well, uh, like your good self. And she's actually uh, in Panto up in Inverness this Christmas. Well, so I, I'm going up to Inverness, bloody miles away from anywhere. And actually, I'm up there for about two weeks. 
and and I, I'm actually really looking forward to it because it's Christmas time for me is about the only time where everything else shuts down. So you literally can't do anything if you even wanted to. So it's it's a great release and it's a great time to sort of reflect and and really think about what you what you're doing and where you want to go. So mm. yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, I've just got a few more questions for you if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Yeah, go. Who are some creative people that that inspire you, and why? What is it about them that uh, draws your attention? Right. Well, my my, my hero uh, in, in 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 the pottery world is a guy. He's not alive anymore. Uh, is a guy called Isaac Button. Yeah, look him up, Isaac Button. He was a total nutter. <laughs> he, what? Because basically, he he would produce thousands of pieces. But what I liked about him was his creativity within his discipline. Um, and and uh, he very much a traditional potter, um, but it, it, he, he sort of lived around uh, the beginning of, of the 20th century, and uh, he, he's, he, produced, he produced like a machine, basically. Uh, and, and although that's not, uh, that's not that inspiring, what's inspiring is that his, his, uh, his testament to what he did for a living and his craft and his discipline to that, to that uh, to that craft, I find I find that really really inspiring. Another one for me is um, is uh, someone like uh, a painter called Patrick Heron. Totally different in a way, um, because although a Patrick Heron uh, is a is a contemporary artist, um, uh, the colours that he would produce and in the combinations of colours, uh, very much sort of surrealist painting. Um, but but they really speak to you. Well, they speak to me anyway. Um, and I, I I just love the colours and uh, and and how those inspire me to to to, to look at. Um, and again, I, I keep on coming back to this word discipline. And and for me, that's that's the key in in, in creativity, which is a kind of a it's it, it's it's almost a, a conflict of interest because you don't want to be too disciplined because you can't be creative. But but you you have to have that discipline within your craft. You probably know that as an actor, you have to have a discipline and a focus in what you're you're trying to achieve within a certain character. But within that, you then you can be as free forming and uh, as 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 you want to be. But it's that discipline and focus to your particular craft that I'm particularly interested in. So so, so many people within the, the craft sector have so much time to explore ideas, but I feel like there's often a really big gap between. Uh, having a great deal of skill, uh, manual skill or, or imaginative skill, and actually taking that to market and turning it into a business and a viable business. Yeah, absolutely. But there's also a sense that by turning it into a business, somehow you are undermining the creativity or you're cheapening the creativity. But clearly, from all the examples that you've given, that it's actually enhanced your creativity to a degree. It's opened up a whole new range of possible options that's given you new ideas, new techniques to think about. It's, it's pushed you in different directions, perhaps. I'm curious, if, is there something that you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? How bloody hard it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, apart from that, uh, to be, well, to, 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 to be really, to be really confident and to, and, and to have a, uh, um, to be really confident in what you do, um, and, and when I started out, I really wasn't, um, and to have a real sort of a, a, a belief and a passion in, in what you're trying to create. But also, um, one of my, 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 my sort of personal mantras to myself is, know what you're good at, but more importantly, realize what you're really not good at. Uh, and, 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 and the things that you're not good at, Leave, leave off, leave well alone, and give it to someone else to help you. There's no, there's no disgrace in asking th- people for help because what you're trying to do is you're, you've got this core idea or this core sort of uh, part of creativity, and how you achieve that is is really uh, not a problem. You, if you if you need to ask for help for certain parts of that that process. All well and good. We see it. We see it time and time again. I know. Uh, you know obviously, Damien Hurst has his own. He has his own workshop where he has 
hundreds of, well, not maybe not hundreds of people, but people working uh, towards his creative idea. Uh, I know Bowie did that uh, because I knew um, I knew certain carpenters that used to work with with Bowie on creating some of his installations. There's no there's no harm and there's no disgrace in asking for help. And uh, sometimes that's always held me back because I've I've always felt that you you have to do everything. Well, you don't because what you're doing is you're giving you're feeding the whole process with the initial idea that you've come up with. And uh, I, I wish I'd learned that uh, a fair few years ago. Yeah. So we, we've talked a lot about, well, you, you've talked a lot about discipline as part of being creative, as almost being a, a skill to, to enable creativity. What are other skills that you think are, are really important to, to you in being creative? Uh, to, to, well, uh, I, I mean, you know, again, not without sound, not sounding like a hippie nightmare, um, because if anyone looked at me or looked at my business, they would never think of me as some kind of holistic, uh, free-thinking kind of guy. Because as you, as you, you've quite rightly pointed out, we're in a very commercial, very real world. But, but actually, just be open. Be open to, uh, be open to the people you meet. Be open to the, uh, the, the, the ideas that you may have. Um, and, 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 Never be afraid to explore those ideas. It really, uh, openness within oneself is is really the, the key to to creativity, man. <laughs> Without sounding too hippie, but but it really it really is. And I know when I'm far more relaxed, I'm far more creative. Um, uh, that's just me. I mean, for some people, you know, they like the pressure. They 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 thrive on that pressure. Um, and I do in in a sense in a business sense, but in a creative sense, uh, you know, when I'm rushing around uh, to going to various events and stuff, I really miss just being downstairs, being on my own, radio fours on, the cats in the corner. Uh, I've got a cup of tea, and and I and I can just uh, just make things uh, in order to free up my mind and 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 create future projects yeah basically um do, do you think anyone can be creative do you think it's something that we all have the potential to be or that we all are or is it something that's reserved for a unique few no uh i don't think it's rever- reserved for a unique f- uh, a few in fact my business partner and i are perfect examples he he he's not creative in the artistic sense um he's he, he's he's really not <laughs> um but but give him a spreadsheet or give him a, a a business project or a business plan and 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 he's on it and he's he's very creative in that kind of way um so creativity can take on all sorts of uh faces and uh and personalities and you don't necessarily have to be creative in the traditional sense of making or painting or, or acting or producing things. There are many ways of being creative. And I, I, I do feel, I do feel, uh, this might sound like a very large statement now, but I, I feel we are, we're all creative. It's just finding that, that path of creativity within oneself. And it might not be, uh, it might not be singing or it might not be pottery or painting or carpentry. But it may be in uh, organising a department in a in a big uh, civil servant organisation. I'm just really taking it to the other other spectrum. Um, so so yeah, I think creativity is always there in everyone. Um, but it, it but I I, I I I would have to admit that quite a lot of people in the world do ne- never find that creative path for themselves. And the ones that do. Uh, uh, are very very lucky. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, if I were to give you someone like Dom, like your business partner, who who identified as non-creative, and you were going to give them one thing to do that might convince them otherwise, what would that be? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I'm not so sure. I don't. I I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, I think it, I think it's interesting because maybe it's it's not even giving someone to, uh, something to do. It might be reframing um, yeah. their perception of creativity. So as you, as you did, you were saying that there are different ways of being creative, and it isn't necessarily in what we would normally call the arts or you know with artistic materials, but with a spreadsheet, and in that that is its own skill well, base. Well, here you go. Then I would probably get him to sit in the workshop for. Uh, a day or so, uh, watch me do something, or s- sit him in a factory and watch him uh, how the process is made. And then I would then get him to create uh, a timeline and a process within that. Um, and and then to see if we can achieve any different ways of, 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 of doing that process, to see if we could improve upon that. Um, and I think that's, that's probably where <laughs> his skills best lie, really. Yeah, yeah. That's a great example. Yeah, because, because um, as you quite rightly say, no, creativity is not just in the aesthetic. Uh, and, and, um, and, and there, are many, there are many forms of creativity, yes, absolutely. Mm. So, uh, another tough question, how would you define creativity? Okay. To create something that has never been created and that speaks to people. That's it. Okay. That's very concise. That's never been created and that it, 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 it speaks to people or people can empathise with it. Um, uh, and I know that's a very, very general statement, but I think that probably just covers everything. And, uh, and, 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 and for me, I'm always trying to achieve something that is different. Uh, and I don't always do that. I don't always do that with the end result. But, but that's what I'm always striving to do. And for me, that is creativity. That is creativity. Yeah. That's brilliant. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that's really, really good. That's really concise as well, which I'm well impressed with. Um, I, I, I don't know if you've had time to do this, but I, I, I was asking if you would possibly have a challenge that you'd want to set for, for listeners. If, have you had an opportunity to think about that? Yes, and I, and I have, and, and 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 obviously the suggestion that you made. I was thinking of that before I, when I came down the email. I was thinking, well, what would I do? And I saw that question, and and you were explaining what that was. That question was about. And before I even saw what you'd suggested, um, and we've done it on the throwdown uh, on the on the on the program. It would be to close your eyes and to do. The, the discipline that you you may may or may not uh, may already do, i.e., throwing a pot or painting or or, or woodwork or anything <laughs> might be might be quite dangerous with woodwork. But but I would I would say, and again, without sounding too sort of airy fairy or hippy, if you close your eyes, it is incredible the sensation you get through your hands and through your perception of what you what you think you're seeing but what you're touching and and it could be it could be the feeling of the brush uh charged up with the with the paint on a canvas it could be the feeling of the wood and the length of the wood and and the the structure of the of the um of the grain through the wood before you start cutting it and the pressure that you would need to cut that piece of wood and i i tell you taking away a sense like eyesight and still touching and feeling and uh, uh, trying to produce something is is a, a is an amazing experience uh, and very easy to do because you just need to cl- close your eyes and it does give you a completely and utterly different perspective on on whatever process that you felt that you uh, you were very very sort of um, uh, 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 familiar with. Um, and it does give you a totally different perspective. Um, I wonder what it would be like if you closed your eyes and you, you acted out a certain character, but because you couldn't see the reaction of the audience or the reaction of the person uh, observing you, whether you, whether, you, uh, w- whether you were actually getting the reaction you wanted, it would be quite a, a, quite a challenge. I'm sure that's a... I'm sure that's a drama nightmare uh, exercise in, in drama schools up and down the country. But, but it, 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 it's a very interesting thing. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, exercise to do. 
Fantastic. So, um, Keith, where, where if, if people want to follow you, they want to find you, find out what you're doing online, where, where would they need to go? KeithBrimerJones.com. Uh, that's that's the uh, the website. Uh, KeithBrimerJones.com or MakeInternational.com. Uh, basically, they're the they're the two websites that we that we run. Um, so yeah, and and through the website you'll be able to uh, go through to the Facebook page or the Instagram or the Twitter and all the other various social media things that we we all uh, are now sort of uh, tied to. Um, but yeah, it's it's all on there. KeithBrimerJones.com. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye, love you. Bye. <laughs>Hey there, thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Keith and his work, you can visit the Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll find images of his work and links to other material. And if you'd like to have a go at Keith's Creative Challenge, you can find a written version on the Creative Challenge page. Just head on over to the website and check it out. And if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be great if you would subscribe to the show, leave a review, or follow me on Instagram, at Practical Creative. Also, just really quickly, if you're interested in ceramics, or makers with an uncompromising approach to their work, then check out my Q&A with Gareth Mason. Gareth is a ceramicist working with a highly distinctive and powerful visual language that challenges the limits of both the clay and the audience in equal measure. You can find it over on the Practical Creative website. Mm -hmm.